patient that we uh, looked at last time uh, got a good uh, commentary from uh, Dr. Lang. Thank you for the comments. Uh, I'd like to go over this case in a little bit more detail. Um, we'll start uh, again with knowing this is a left eye because the nerve fiber layer uh, is over here and is thicker. Um, sometimes you'll see these structures. The characteristic uh, of this is a bright reflectivity uh, in the inner retina accompanied by shadowing uh, more posterior to this. And this is the hallmark of a blood vessel. These are retinal blood vessels in this um, cross section. The vessel happens to just be running uh, in the section of the slice, and uh, at least it's curving around, so it's either coming from above or below into the image, and then it's going away. Uh, so it looks a little different, but don't be fooled by that. Uh, oftentimes these will be uh, just linear, but we'll always have this same pattern of bright uh, reflectivity in the inner retina and uh, dark posteriorly. Uh, we're starting with the most normal side of the image, uh, the nasal image here, and uh, we see the RPE and ISOS. Uh, as we move uh, more centrally, we can see that the RPE becomes uh, a little uh, undulated and bumpy, and then we start to see a frank elevation uh, of the uh, RPE into uh, multiple uh, pigment epithelial detachments. Uh, as I noted on uh, another video with dry AMD, it's when you have these RPE detachments that you're able to see um, Brooks membrane down below. So that's this line. Uh, and then you can see the choroid uh, deep to that. Now, uh, on the nasal side of the image, we can see the, the uh, choroidoscleral junction uh, here. Where it's kind of defined uh, not very well, but we see a large choroidal vessel here and then the sclera and then we see no further vessels as we move centrally and then temporally we lose that because there's a lot more going on in the retina. Um, uh, Dr. Lang had pointed out that a uh, enhanced depth image, uh, an EDI, um, that this was not that. If, if it were, it's possible that we would see the choroid, but uh, we may not. Um, at any rate, it's in this part of the image, it's not uh, overly thin or thick and really doesn't help us with a diagnosis. And I'm not convinced that uh, just looking at uh, a normal size, quote unquote, choroid is helpful uh, in this circumstance. Uh, but let's, let's look at what we know. So here we see the ISOS get lost. Um, this is clearly abnormal. It falls and accompanying that is a th uh, thinning of the outer nuclear layer that's collapsing. We see a preservation of the external limiting membrane. And if we follow that, we can see that it really becomes quite elevated. We know that all of this here, this dark band, is outer nuclear layer. Um, we see this signature of Henley's fiber layer where there are turns going from a dark to a bright signal is characteristic of the directional reflectivity that is evident. Uh, in Henley's fiber layer, and you can see my other postings on that. This is also um, present here, um, where the loss of the outer nuclear layer and ISOS tissue has caused um, these layers to collapse somewhat, and consequently this area becomes uh, brighter. We can see that the inner retina is relatively well preserved, and there is a good um, foveal dip. Uh, what we know be, uh, from this being the external limiting membrane is that the ISOS must be somewhere kind of in here. Um, that's also highly directionally reflective and um, may not uh, be visible if there is a change in its orientation. Uh, we know that the distance from this external limiting membrane to the RPE is uh, heightened. So there's a lot of extra material in here uh, and subretinal fluid. Um, there's clearly subretinal fluid here uh, this is uh, dark and is the signature of fluid. Uh, this is accompanied by these bright um, hyperreflective foci uh, that can really be one of two things, uh, one of three things rather. It can either be uh, exudate, um, pigment, or blood. Um, in this case, um, there is not a huge amount of uh, loss of deeper reflectivity. You can see that it's slightly diminished here and we get some sense that there's a, 
a decreased reflectivity or a shadow going deep, but it's it's not marked or it's not massive. Um, and in fact, over here you barely see any uh, attenuation of the deeper signal uh, at all. Um, but this uh, is, uh, I know, clinically uh, to be exudate and uh, accompanied by subretinal fluid. This tells you that there is uh, certainly um, activity um, present. Um, but to come back to my point, there is actually likely subretinal fluid here as well. And we know this not because there's a big dark area, uh, but rather because the distance between this external limiting membrane, which is a good landmark, uh, and the RPE is massively heightened. The only thing that should be between these are the photoreceptor inner segments and outer segments. And their uh, length is typically on this order from the ELM uh, down uh, to the RPE, so this is a massively increased distance uh, and there's got to be uh, abnormal fluid uh, in there. Sometimes the uh, chronic fluid can begin to be uh, more reflective so we may not be seeing it as dark uh, like it is here. Um, so overall what we have in this patient is uh, pigment epithelial detachments, uh, subretinal fluid accompanied by uh, exudate. Uh, there is no inner retinal fluid uh, but this is an active uh, case of wet uh, macular degeneration in a patient um, who is relatively young and is being treated with anti-VEGF agents. Uh, the presence of fluid has already cost the patient some of their photoreceptors, which is, um, uh, is a uh, consequence of having subretinal fluid present for a long time, uh, although this may not um, be entirely permanent. This patient's vision uh, is actually recovered and clinked to 2030. So they're doing extremely well, I'm very satisfied. Um, this is a very illustrative case just on this single image. Uh, thanks for watching.